Uh, warm welcome, everyone. Uh, enviably, we have the evening session here at day two of Sousta. Um, so many thanks for joining us this late in the evening. Uh, as people slowly come into the room, and I see we have some colleagues who've stayed over from negotiations, I will invite you to, to just step forward and come a bit closer so we can have a bit more of an intimate discussion and exchange. So my name is Khalil Walji. I'll be moderating this. Uh, I'll be the moderator for today's session. I'm from C4ECraft, just across the gate here at UNEP. I know many of you have traveled far and wide to join us here in Nairobi. And um, as always, we can't forget that we're also joined online by many colleagues, members of the task force on monitoring. Uh, I think at last glance, we're about 50 plus. So a warm welcome to those who are joining us online here in Nairobi. For the session, delivering restoration outcomes for biodiversity and human well-being. You can see we have a very packed panel this afternoon, this evening, uh, with partners from the UN Decade, from UNEP, from FAO, and also some uh, country spotlights as well. In 2023, partners of the UN Decade and the CBD Secretariat began working together to develop a roadmap for Target 2 and to develop the technical guidance to streamline data, reporting guidance, and to operationalize restoration actions. So in today's panel, we will be, we will be launching the Target 2 draft manual for comments. We will also invite a number of country colleagues to spotlight their progress on their NBSAPs on the road to COP15 in a few short months, uh, and to share how they've progressed in selecting of their indicators. So to get us started and to launch the event, I would like to first invite Ms. Natalia Alexiva the, uh, from UNEP, who is the head of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Thank you very much. I'm the coordinator of the UN Decade, and it, indeed it's my pleasure to maybe not see that many people around, but hopefully quite a lot of colleagues online, and I'm sure that the, the event is going to be recorded, so we probably would be able to share the, the links now. Um, I'm just checking. Okay. Um, indeed, as mentioned, the, the Target 2 is actually the kind of base uh, for the also for the UN Decade to deliver because UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration was launched in 2021 as a kind of global movement and of course as a kind of unity of partners, UN agencies, countries to move on the restoration and to deliver on the promises and all the commitments which were made before. As it was counted, it's it's one billion hectares which were committed, but we were not able sometimes to see the concrete results and to see also the fruits of this restoration. So that's why UN Decade is really trying to bring different elements together. Of course, as said, delivering on the very practical, on the let's say ground level in terms of so-called flagships. And we've been proud actually in this in the very, very same room we were just discussing with colleagues, we had the Gala of Hope during UNE6 in February, where we've been celebrating seven new flagships, uh, which were brought in through the uh, application process, uh, which uh, we have actually also open now. So we're also inviting the countries to submit their best restoration examples and best practices to be celebrated and announced. But in addition to this, of course, we have quite a lot of uh, technical work and a lot of uh, also uh, methodological support to go through certain kind of elements like what kind of restoration, where it happens, uh, how to report, how to kind of uh, get the numbers, uh, because everyone, of course, is referring to the benefits of restoration, but sometimes we're not able to quantify and qualify very clearly what doesn't bring to restore certain ecosystems to have uh, better livelihoods, to have better food security, to have also, of course, uh, uh, to, to be meeting the climate and biodiversity targets. So here we are actually on target two, as it was already kind of presented. And uh, the, the monitoring part of the target two is exactly trying to see how do we restore and what exactly we restore, right? And with uh, target two aiming at 30% uh, of the restored ecosystems uh, compared to the degraded ecosystems, right? We're really trying to see also in terms of uh, how this uh, uh, I mean, of course, on the technical side, we're trying to see how to measure this restoration, but at the same time, also how to be able to prove that restoration has happened and uh, what what exactly you, ha you had been restoring. And uh, I'm looking forward uh, during this event also to learn more in terms of the uh, manual, which was produced jointly under the UN Decade. And um, I would be handing over to Tina Vahanin from FAO, who would be bringing a bit more details in terms of what exactly has been done as a part of this uh, monitoring activities under the Target 2, but also as a part of the monitoring task force of the UN Decade. So I'll stop here for the sake of time. I know we're running a bit over and then hand over to Tina. Thank you. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. And uh, really, it, it's great to hear your introduction of the UN decade in general. So I'm focusing more on my introduction to the particular topic of this uh, this uh, event. It's really to join, a great pleasure to join the colleagues from the CPD Secretariat, of course, UNEP, whom we are co-leading the um, uh, the uh, UN decade and uh, SER, C4 ICRAF, and particular welcome, of course, to our country delegates uh, from uh, Kenya and, and Japan. So, um, as many of you may know already, um, FAO is custodian for one of the headline uh, targets of um, uh, uh, target two of, uh, of uh, GBF. Um, area under restoration. And that's uh, why we are the custodian, this stems from the work that we do jointly under the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. Um, we are working hard with many, many partners across the world and uh, various partners, countries, scientists, uh, organizations uh, to, to support the CPD parties in particular to support uh, to in their uh, and the restoration practitioners on the ground to set their own restoration targets and the ways to monitoring progress. So, as regards to monitoring progress, um, um, FAO is hosting the uh, framework for ecosystem um, uh, uh, restoration monitoring. It's called FIRM. We will hear much more about this later this event. Um, but it really is advancing capacity and transparency in monitoring progress for target two of GPF and the UN decade on uh, ecosystem restoration. And as I said, it's a very collaborative effort, even though the firm is, is hosted by FAO. So, and then to the very title of this event, um, at FAO, this intersection of biodiversity and human well-being is really at the heart of our mandate and our work, especially how we can protect and restore our environment and conserve biodiversity whilst ensuring human well-being. And clearly, restoration is the, is the one activity that, that brings the win-win and uh, it it brings uh, it brings the it's a glue for for this human well-being and and protection of environment. So um, in earlier this year, um, the partners of the UN decades, uh, including the CPD Secretariat for UNEP, SER, C4, ICRAF, again we work together uh, to support the development of a roadmap for the GPF Target Two. And this was discussed and shaped up at the joint FAO CPD workshop uh, last year, um, uh, held in November, uh, November in Rome. And during this workshop, over 100 participants uh, representing countries, IPLCs, the international organizations, and so forth, identified country needs, addressed technical and scientific gaps, and outlined a comprehensive plan for country support. It was four day event, really full of action and hands on working on the technical matters. A key component uh, of the roadmap is the collaborative development of the resource guide for target two. That will provide technical guidance and resources for countries and restoration implementers to update their national restoration targets and operationalize restoration activities. So this side event, uh, as Khalil was mentioned already, this side event will introduce the key content of, uh, of the draft resource guide. And to help refine the guide, we really look forward to hearing from you, your experiences, your challenges, your success, your gaps in setting up the national restoration targets. And we would really want to hear uh, uh, um, specifically how to address the gaps in non-terrestrial ecosystem restoration baselines and definitions. So your feedback here will inform the final guide uh, to be launched at COP16. And we will launch this kind now for the consultation process after this event. And as I said already, we will hear more updates what is happening actually under the monitoring framework firm. Uh, but currently uh, it has 20, uh, 250 restoration initiatives from 94 countries and over 1,500 restoration good practices. 
So relatively good progress so far, but we need to do we need to do more. So really, we look forward for your engagement in this side event and for your feedback so that we can actually uh, refine this guide uh, further. Thanks from my side. Thank you. Over to you, Helen. I, of course, I didn't take the opportunity to introduce Tina. Tina is the Deputy Director at FAO's Division of Forestry. So um, Thank <laughs> many thanks to both Natalia and Tina for setting the scene for this side event. You've heard about the roadmap, and uh, it's already been mentioned now a few times, this Target 2 resource manual. So let's not tease it any further. Um, I will turn it over next to uh, Mr. George Gann, who's the International Policy Lead at the Society for Ecological Restoration, to present and to officially launch the draft of the Target 2 menu. Very good. Um, good evening for those of you in Nairobi, and thanks for joining online, those of you from the rest of the world. We're going to take a look at the uh, the resource guide that we've been working on now for a long while. We're going to introduce the resource guide for target to the restoration target for the CBD Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, during this presentation, we're going to um, we are going to uh, look at the background on the process an overview of the document, focus on the key elements and the opportunities for everybody to engage. To remind ourselves uh, for target two, the restoration target, we want to ensure that by 2030, at least 30% of areas of degraded terrestrial, inland water, and coastal and marine ecosystems are under effective restoration in order to enhance biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services, ecological integrity, and connectivity. So this idea of looking at these specific ecosystem types, um, terrestrial versus inland water and coastal and marine ecosystems is really important to the target and we're going to cycle back to this um, as we go through the talk. All right, to give you an idea of how this all started, um, everybody knows, or most people may know, that there's a lot of guidance out there. And so we didn't want to produce something new and extraneous and redundant, but rather to try and pull together as much as we could of the guidance that already existed in the world. And so that starts with the short-term action plan on ecosystem restoration, which was a decision of the CBD in 2016 at COP13. Um, some follow-up documents that uh, were created in terms of the companion to the STAPER, um, a recent um, massive online course on ecosystem restoration, work by the UNCCD on land degradation neutrality, and then recent documents, um, such as the guidance on the 30 by 30 target three, and also on target one on landscape approaches. So this is just an example of some of the major documents that we looked at in pulling together the resource guide. So the background on the process is that uh, with the, with the uh, GBF approved in, in uh, 2022 and 2023, um, the CBD and partners um, held a, a number of online webinars um, in November, we had a workshop in Rome um, where we discussed many of the issues uh, pertaining to developing uh, or revising the NBSAPs and how to get going on target two. Uh, and then the, we began in earnest the drafting of the guide with internal and partner review. So now we are in the process where there will be an issue, there'll be a notification issued for feedback to the parties and uh, this uh, subsidized event, uh, and we're looking for feedback back by June 10. So as we've already heard, this is a collaborative process and uh, the, the lead team on this uh, resource guide is the Society for Ecological Restoration. 
the CBD, FAO, and C4E craft. So the kind of information that we're going to be looking for when you have a chance to take a look at the resource guide is the essential information. Is there any essential information that is missing? What information in the guide is unnecessary so that we can make the document more concise or as concise as possible? We're looking for short case studies to help illustrate any of the key points in the guide and any other feedback that you may want to give. The purpose of the resource guide is to assist countries and partners in translating restoration commitments into restoration plans and operationalizing restoration at scales called for in target two. And uh, the clock is ticking. There's a lot of work to do in not very much time. So this is a big lift and we're hoping that the resource guide will help us in that work. Here's an overview of the guide. It's broken down into three sections. The introduction section discusses why target two is important. Why is it so critical to, uh, to accomplish and how it interacts with other parts of the GBF. We discuss the lessons from the IHE targets. What did we learn in that process in the last decade? a description and the relevance of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration uh, and the synergies between the UN Decade and Target 2, as well as other global ecosystem restoration initiatives of which there are many. In the second section, which we will um, look at a little bit more detail this evening, uh, how the integration of Target 2 into national biodiversity targets and the national biodiversity strategy and action plans. In section three, we will discuss the operationalizing of ecosystem restoration in order to meet the targets and goals of the GBF. All right, so in section two, we discuss integrating target two into national biodiversity targets and updated NBSAPs. And we begin by discussing and bringing together all of the various guidance on NBSAPs with links to the resources that are available so that parties can and partners can uh, can move forward with the process as it relates to target two. Some key points that uh, that we have uh, included in the in the resource guide and is that national policies need to be applicable at the subnational local and project scales because those are the scales that ecosystem restoration actually operates at. So whatever is in the NBSAPs needs to translate into action on the ground. The NBSAPs uh, should align with Section C of the GBF, um, titled Considerations for Implementation, and there's a long list of items for consideration there. The NBSAP should include finance and capacity development plans that include support for Target 2. The NBSAP should align and create synergies with other multilateral environmental agreements. And so this issue of how to coordinate um, and synergize uh, the, the various agreements that countries have is very, very important to Target 2 because restoration cuts across a whole lot of different agreements. And then the NBSAP should select explicit numeric targets for restoration. All right, um, we also discussed the relationship between Target 2 and other GBF targets. This is just an example of target one and target three on spatial planning and protected areas. But we found that uh, the, the relationship is very strong between target two and 20, well, it'd be 19 of the other 22 targets. So there's a, there's a relationship between those and we explain um, how they're related and how we can um, achieve uh, efficiency and synergies between those targets. In section 2.3, we discuss who to involve in the NBSAP process, which includes indigenous people, stakeholders, right holders, and knowledge holders, and optimally the engagement of all of those folks in a broad and active participation in the development of the NBSAPs at the national level. In sections 2.4 to 2.7, we discuss monitoring, reporting, and interoperability of data um, in terms of the headline indicator of area under restoration, the different ways that ecosystems can be classified and how to uh, encourage countries to, um, to design, plan, implement, and monitor restoration at the, at the most precise scale possible. And the disaggregation uh, by restoration type 
in terms of uh, ecological restoration versus rehabilitation and other kinds of restoration that deliver different outcomes. Now, Julian Fox later in this, uh, in this event will be digging in a lot more into these items 2.4 to 2.7 in terms of, of the monitoring and the framework for ecosystem restoration monitoring. All right, so section three is the largest section, operationalizing restoration for target two. And in 3.1, we discussed what is restoration. So um, we are using uh, the definition of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, which is a very broad definition that includes all kinds of activities. Um, and just for the record, the process of halting and reversing degradation resulting in improved ecosystem services and recovered biodiversity. Ecosystem restoration encompasses a wide continuum of practices depending on local conditions and societal choice. And this relates to the restorative continuum that was included in the SER 2019 ecological restoration standards. And um, the idea that there are the different kinds of activities that can take place in different parts of, of uh, the environment from cities uh, to production, landscapes, um, all the way over to ecological restoration where we're restoring degraded natural ecosystems. And these are all different activities that yield different outcomes. Very important is this idea of the difference between uh, rehabilitation and ecological restoration. And this is from uh, a guidance document by Future Earth and Geobon and later a paper by Lili et al. in PLUS One. And the idea that um, we need to we need to restore both natural ecosystems as well as production ecosystems, and that uh, in order to in order to restore natural ecosystems, we need to use the process of ecological restoration, and we can do that either through the restoration of degraded natural ecosystems or ecosystems natural ecosystems that have been destroyed or transformed into other kinds of ecosystems. Um, but we also need to restore transformed ecosystems. So agricultural lands that are no longer productive or grazing lands or so forth. Um, and these are transformed ecosystems that also uh, we need to apply restoration to. In 3.2, we discuss the key elements of target two. This is taking the language of the target itself. We're looking at the baselines and area under restoration, uh, the outcome sought, the concept of effective restoration and the different major ecosystem types. So if we look at baselines and area under restoration, um, by decision, the period 2011 to 2020 should be used as a reporting baseline when data are available for monitoring and reporting purposes. Um, we recommend the selection of numeric targets for each country for, for major ecosystem types within countries. So that is inland waters or terrestrial or marine and individual ecosystems at a more precise scale where possible. Defining degraded ecosystems can be challenging but there are tools that are available, um, such as the, the work by the UNCCD on land degradation neutrality and the work on the Red List of Ecosystems, for example, that can help in this, in this uh, effort. And then we provide in the manual the key definitions of degradation in different contexts. So degradation is described differently in terms of how it relates to biodiversity, how it relates to restoration, production, and ecosystem services. So all of those defini de definitions are provided so that um, everyone can understand the differences. And then importantly, policymakers need to agree on a definition of and metrics for the concept of degraded at the country and major ecosystem level. The outcomes sought for restoration include, and this is from the target, enhanced biodiversity to recover biodiversity at all levels. So this is the gene, the species, the community, the ecosystem, the landscape, but also temporal variety or variability in terms of, of when organisms are present in the landscape. And so this uh, pertains to things like threatened species or degraded ecosystems. We need to enhance ecosystem functions and services to recover the functions and processes that underpin ecosystems and deliver ecosystem services, such as clean water and production of food and other products. Enhance eco ecological integrity to recover the full range of attributes that make up ecosystems from landforms and soils to water quality, uh, quantity and timing, species composition, structure, and food webs and troph trophic interactions. So this is essentially the idea of the condition of natural ecosystems. And then enhancing connectivity to improve beneficial connectivity of ecosystems under restoration with nearby ecosystems 
and landscapes and seascapes. And the most well-known of that, of course, are corridors, but there are many other ways of connecting ecosystems under restoration. All right, the idea of effective restoration. So target two calls for effective restoration and what exactly is that? So we are, um, we are suggesting that we define effective restoration as standards-based restoration underpinned by agreed principles resulting in balanced net gain for people and nature. And so on the left, we have the ecological restoration principles um, uh, from SER's um, pr principles and standards for ecological restoration. And on the right, the principles from the UN decade. Um, and these principles are very, very uh, aligned and very similar, but different in ways that are important. And then we suggest some, just provide some examples of some other guidelines, principles, and standards that are available um, over different kinds of sectors, biomes, et cetera, that are out there in the world. And we all understand that there's many of these and there's new standards and guidelines every day. All right, major ecosystem types in target two. So we have terrestrial inland water, inland water, coastal and marine. And in addition, we have to discuss production systems which are essential to delivering ecosystem services. And some of the, um, the guidance is to integrate restoration across these types using spatial planning that also considers and integrates restoration in protected areas and in landscapes, watersheds and seascapes being utilized for agriculture, forestry, fisheries and other production uses, thus tying target two very strongly to targets one, three, and 10. We suggest that restoration should be planned, implemented, and monitored at the highest level of precision practicable. So if you're using a global um, ecosystem typology, um, at least try to get the, everything done or planned and implemented at the biome level, but the ecosystem functional group is better if you can. If you're using national um, systems of ecosystem classification, the lower down that you can get, um, the more precise you can get, the better. And then each of these ecosystem types have different uh, attributes that are common with other ecosystem types and ones that are unique. And so we want to uh, determine what those are and understand how they relate to restoration. All right, in sections 3.3 .3 to 3.7, this is uh, actually quite a bit of content. We don't have time to go into it here, but we've um, developed uh, material based on the short-term action plan on ecosystem restoration the four groups of activities. So those four groups of activities are assessment of opportunities, improving the institutional enabling environment for restoration, planning, implementation, and ongoing management, and then monitoring evaluation feedback and sharing results. For each of these um, groups of activities, we offer key steps. That's a list of activities that can help to accomplish these different things. Considerations from policy, science, and practice. What are the kind of the new things that people are talking about or, or gaining an understanding of in terms of how it applies to these different uh, groups of activities and then uh, additional tools and guidance of which there are many. All right, so uh, where we are now is uh, we invite you to take a look at the resource guide. It is available online. If you wanna jot down this, uh, this uh, URL here. So cbd.int forward slash restoration forward slash implementation forward slash review. And what we're asking for again is what information is missing, what information is not necessary, um, any other feedback, and then um, we'll discuss the short case studies here in a second. So we're looking for feedback by June 10 to the secretariat at cbd.int. So for those of you who have case studies, countries, parties that have case studies that, uh, that you would like to submit, Here's some guidance. Uh, we want the case studies to relate to key points in the resource guide, to provide sample text of no more than half a page in any UN language, to provide links to background information supporting the case study so that we can take a look and understand it a little bit better, and then provide supporting images or figures and your contact information. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, George. Comes back here, yeah. No, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, thank you very much. I think for walking us through the the meat and bones of the resource guide. Um, I think we'll take a short pause from present presentations from the panel, and we'll open up the floor for questions. So we'll invite invite you all to to take the microphone, and I'll ask that if you do take the floor, please introduce yourself and your delegation or your affiliation. 
uh, and also an invitation to our colleagues online. I see there's now over 60 participants who have joined us. I think we have some microphones. Ah, you, you guys all have microphones in front of you, so there are no floating microphones. Let's see. Okay, so one of the comments we do have um, online is from uh, George, I believe your team in IRC in South Florida. Um, so I wanted to ask you, because of course, we, you know, we've been speaking about a lot of these, uh, these standards or a lot of these guidelines. So can you speak from your own experience on the ground, doing restoration work in practice, uh, and speak to how the standards actually help to deliver effective restoration? Sure. Thanks, Khalil. Um, that's actually a really important question. So for those of you who don't know me, I, I've been doing restoration for about 45 years, um, primarily in Florida uh, and also some other places um, at all kinds of different scales and all kinds of different restoration. And I never really saw myself as a standards person. But when I got involved in working on the SER standards and, and all the subsequent work that has occurred, um, one of the things that was really important to me was, did these, did these standards and did this guidance help me in my work on the ground? And if it didn't, then they needed to be rewritten. And so for me, um, it's been a really important part of my practice to, to understand the global thinking about restoration and I brought a lot of new ideas into uh, into our practice in South Florida, um, and um, and then and tested out these various uh, these various things like the principles and the recovery wheels that are in the SER standards and so forth. So I found it to be incredibly helpful as a practitioner, and the the uptake of both the UN Decade principles and now the standards of practice, as well as the SER versions. Um, has been growing and growing and we're learning as we're going. And this is also the important part is that, is that people have to use these things in order for us to really understand and improve them moving forward. Thanks, George. Um, I see another question here online. How does the guide address social and economic impacts from restoration, even if they are beyond the scope of targets? So you mentioned, of course, connections to the other targets. Maybe you can weave that in as well. Sure. Um, so I don't think the, the, the social and, and economic and cultural components are separated from restoration at all. Yeah. They're integral. Uh, if we don't have, uh, if we don't take these things into consideration then, then restoration ultimately will fail. And this is why we titled this uh, side event the way that we did. That this is about both biodiversity and human well-being. And in order to, to have human well-being, we have to take into consideration all of the things that are important to people from their culture uh, to their living, and um, and so we've I think we've done a good job in the, in the resource guide to to tie these things together and provide guidance and to show how we can better link target two on restoration with all of these other targets that um, that are in this, this realm. Thank you. I see we have Kim Friedman who's just in front. Go ahead, Kim. George, I just wondered. You know, we're struggling a little bit in the aquatic world to understand how to communicate well. What are the impacts that we're looking for with um, aquatic systems? And then often it's not necessarily the area of coverage or even the area of coverage is hard to understand because you're talking about the access to water, the way water might travel, which it didn't travel before. And I just wondered how how much of a struggle it's been to take a very terrestrial concept and bring in the differences that we find in aquatic systems, which are obviously so important to both people, but also to land environments. Thank you. So there's a bit in that, uh, a bit in that question there, Kim, uh, but thank you. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of restoration practice, um, there's been a lot of restoration done, obviously inland waters, there's a ton of restoration work that's been done um, in Marine. Maybe that's lagging a little bit, um, except in certain ecosystems like mangroves and coral reefs and shellfish reefs, for example, where there's been um, a lot of work done. The the difficulty, I, I think, really is is in the guidance and the, and the monitoring components. You know, where you're you know you're dealing with uh, linear features, you're dealing with uh, isolated features that have underground connectivity and so forth, um, or you're um, dealing with in in the marine realm. You know, where you're dealing with basically you know, a 3D environment that um, doesn't translate well to this idea of kind of a, a flat um, 
area under restoration. So I think that this is a challenge. It's a challenge that I think that we can solve. I think that we can find a way to communicate and to monitor um, marine and coastal as well as in the waters um, very well, but it's gonna take some work. It's gonna take some time. Yeah, please. Thank you very much for asking. There would be actually another side event on 16th of May, which would be exactly diving into more freshwater ecosystems and uh, similar discussions. So I would also invite you to join because this would be also a joint event uh, with a lot of fruitful information. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I see the colleague in the back. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Mark Dickey Collis. Uh, I'm a member of the IUCN Fisheries Expert Group. So, George, I just want to press you a little more. My question is, is it an issue, as you've just alluded to, of monitoring not being uh, sufficient at the moment in the marine environment? Or is it that conceptually we need to make further developments in the marine environment? Yeah, all of those, all of those things are true. Um, definitely, there needs to be more uh, conceptual work. Uh, as well, and uh, we've had many conversations with colleagues about, you know, where put, where people are putting attention in the marine realm, and and uh, where the most effective restoration could occur in terms of biodiversity outcomes or human well-being outcomes and so forth. So, um, there's definitely uh, more that needs to be done, um, and this is not my area of expertise, so I'm not going to try to have all the answers, but to say that we're engaged in this conversation, and um, again, there's much work to be done in this area. So we just have to focus on on figuring it out. Thank you very much, everyone, for the questions. We'll take George off the, the hot seat for the moment <laughs> and move on because we know we're already late into the evening. We do have one question online from, from Robin Chasden about translations. So we have informal translations of the documents. Um, we're still yet to be seen if this draft version will be translated, but we will communicate after the session on um, how we can make sure to get the draft available in multiple languages so that comments can be brought in, of course, from a diversity of voices. I think we're going to move to the next part of the agenda. Uh, and we have invited two panelists to join us to share an update on their own NBSAP developments, uh, country spotlights. And the session organizers have prepared uh, a number of, of questions to prompt responses as well, uh, and also to facilitate a bit of an exchange between the panelists, but also between you in the room. So to get us started, um, I would like to, to turn the microphone over to Mr. Waturu Suzuki from the Biodiversity Strategy Office in the Ministry of Environment of Japan. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it was a last minute uh, change, but we appreciate your flexibility. Um, first, Mr. Watari, can you just give us an update on the NBSAP process in Japan? How are things going? How is the target setting? And, and what can we look forward to in the road to COP15? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me uh, to this uh, great uh, side event. And, um, uh, and also asking for our uh, status of uh, NBSAP. Uh, we prepared uh, the sixth NBSAP uh, March last year, and we are still working on the full translation uh, of the uh, strategy into English. But I, I brought some uh, brochures uh, for uh, to share. So if uh, any anyone interested in um, uh, our NBSAP, please uh, come to uh, our delegation. And also, um, I think this uh, nature restoration Law I'm uh, uh, going to introduce uh, was uh, one of the uh, five or six uh, new proposals uh, uh, included in the uh, second NBSAP. And we, um, Japanese government, uh, enacted uh, another law which is on uh, invasive alien uh, species. So, um, uh, but it's about 20 years ago. And uh, when uh, we ask uh, the person who in charge of this uh, act, they, they uh, he was so surprised um, that uh, uh, why CBD participants interested in Japanese uh, law on restoration, which is tw over 20 years ago, but actually uh, this law was born from our NBSA. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And then I think in follow-up as well, um, we've been hearing, and I think of course throughout the documentation of the the KMGBF um, is this idea of uh, whole of government, whole of society approach. Can you just speak to the legal policy mechanisms, which you just mentioned? I think the restoration law in Japan was born out of the, the second NBSAP 
if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So can you speak to how that's been catalytic to enable uh, the support of not only the Ministry of Environment, but other ministries where the drivers of degradation actually are and, and sort of beyond the, the home of where the NB NBCEP actually sits? Thank you very much for asking a re really relevant uh, question. Uh, it is indeed, uh, it is very e efficient because this uh, idea was uh, first introduced by the NBSAP, which is not uh, a strategy for Ministry of the Environment, but, but it is uh, the strategy uh, as a whole of the government. So um, the major uh, player of this uh, act is uh, maybe uh, Ministry of Construction, Ministry of Agriculture, but uh, Ministry of the Environment can uh, facilitate uh, uh, those uh, collaboration among uh, all those uh, stakeholders. So um, the basically the role of national government is to formulate a basic policy uh, and um, so we uh, uh, provide those uh, basic policy uh, to uh, to the uh, group of people, and also uh, the uh, law uh, require um, those uh, um, stakeholders to establish uh, council, uh, which uh, include all the stakeholders. Uh, so the law. Uh, is to uh, bring those uh, people uh, on the same ta uh, table. And also uh, we uh, require the council have a science science panel uh, for to provide scientific uh, uh, advice. So um, this uh, council also uh, requested to uh, manage the uh, restoration project on, on uh, based on the adaptive uh, approach uh, based on the scientific informa information. So uh, this is our first attempt uh, to uh, to bring all those minister, uh, ministries and all those stakeholders, uh, local residents, experts uh, uh, on uh, um, uh, the same place uh, with this uh, structure uh, set out by uh, the law. So that is my uh, reaction. Thank you. And, and since we have a bit more time, then I'll, I'll ask you one final Question, Mr. Satkuri, can you speak a bit to this idea of uh, cultural ecosystems, which I know are important in Japan? And it was mentioned at some of the the opening remarks. This idea of bio um, restoration, not only for the biophysical, but of course for the for the human dimension. And specifically, maybe you can speak to this unique um, restoration landscape, um, Satoyama, which is I think very important. And if you could speak to that, that'd be great. Thank you very much for uh, asking that question. Yes. Um... Basically, um, in Japan, we have too many people in a small island. And uh, so we uh, modified our landscapes and seascapes in many ways. And it used to be very sustainable uh, because if uh, we degraded the ecosystem, we cannot live. Uh, however, after uh, the uh, e e economical development after World War II, um, the, we uh, modify uh, the ecosystem uh, landscapes and maybe part of the seascapes uh, in an excessive way um, without any uh, adaptive uh, monitoring. So um, the cultural um, aspect is very important because uh, our culture is to uh, live uh, with uh, nature uh, to uh, uh, to get uh, services from from ecosystems as well as uh, we sustain uh, maybe de decent uh, bio uh, biological diversity uh, on, on those uh, uh, e ecosystems. So uh, to have those local uh, residents, ro all the local groups, uh, in particular uh, women uh, who 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 is very close to uh, the ecosystem through, you know, uh, daily life. Uh, cooking and cultivating and all those things. So um, the, this uh, structure and the council uh, it's, uh, allow us to uh, take up all those voices and also um, the uh, how uh, reflect the way uh, the local community uh, was uh, managed uh, the ecosystem in a traditional way. Thank you very much. We'll move to our next country. Thank you very much, Mr. Satkuru.
And um, I'd like to invite Dr. Lucy Nga to provide us also with an update on Kenya's NBSAP process. How are things proceeding? Uh, and maybe you can also share your perspectives on how you're taking this uh, global framework and you're translating it to the needs and to the to the um, to the Kenyan context, to the national level, but then also your work at the county level, because it is, of course, a multi-level challenge. Thank you, thank you very much, and good evening, colleagues. Um, I'm actually very privileged to give the update of where we are with the review and the writing of NBC for Kenya to the Cumming Montreal Global Diversity Framework. For starters, I must say, uh, we have as a country made quite some progress uh, because we have reviewed our national targets or we have developed our national targets that are aligned to the 23 global targets. And the reason was that um, as we go ahead to develop the NBSAP, where the targets will be the main body of the NBSAP, we decided to first step back and develop the national targets align them to the global, but also align them to the national circumstances, our priorities, um, so that as we report to the global platform, we also report to the party or to the country needs, so that when we report, then we are able to develop policies from the work we do, so that we don't seem just to be working for reporting for the, you know, for the, the, the global platform. Now, as we were doing this, we realized that as we developed the national targets, we realized we had a lot of data gaps. As, 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 as we speak, we're in the process of doing what we are calling a rapid data um, assessment, uh, baseline data assessment, to pick at least some baselines for our targets so that uh, as we start now packaging the NBSAP finally, we have a baseline that we'll be working with towards, you know, you report against the change and the change must have a baseline from where you started. So the baseline assessment is due for finalization. Uh, the draft targets are there as now. And then uh, the process of developing the national targets was very inclusive. I must admit it's one of the processes for quite a while as a government, because we had the civil society, the NGOs and the, the youth were very represented. The IPLC teams were there, both um, from the very local to the organizations that are you know larger that are representing the all those entities the issue of gender was also very well articulated in, in as we were reviewing our um, targets uh, as you remember target 23 i think was born in Nairobi <laughs> uh, on our way to Montreal so it's a target that we are also trying to uh, those of you who are here on i think on Sunday or Saturday when the women caucus were trying to look at the way we are going to look at that would understand the, the challenges that are there, but we are going to see how we embed that um, gender aspect into the NBSAP. So in terms of making it to the Kenya context, uh, that's the reason we did the national targets because the global targets, they are not very far different, but uh, I want to give an example of target one that talks of the spatial planning. And the, the reporting will be whether a party has a spatial plan that is participatory developed, on and on and on. But then when you come back to your country, you ask yourself, so what? This country is governed at two levels. We have a national government and 47 counties. So be asking ourselves, apart from having a one national spatial plan, do the other 47 entities have a spatial plan to govern their biodiversity aspect down there? So that's how we are making all the targets, bringing them to the Kenyan context. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lucy. I want to ask you a follow-up question in regards to Kenya's uh, policy on, on restoration. K Kenya had the forest and landscape restoration uh, policy first. Then very recently, there, I think there was the 15 billion tree policy as well. And, and we hear that in the pipeline, there's a, a Kenya national ecosystem restoration strategy and policy. And I think that will dovetail nicely with the NBSAP. How do you see that that, that policy was sort of shaping how Kenya moves forward with Target 2? Yes, there's a lot of, uh, in fact, just a few days back, we were trying to look at all these documents and uh, asking ourselves, should we try and consolidate them? Because as you have described them, you realize they are talking of restoration, conservation, uh, 15 billion trees, all these speak of the same thing, but different language. And I think as a country, we're at the point where we want now to consolidate that to one strategic document that uh, can be used to implement because when you have several documents speaking on the same subject but in a different angle sometimes can um, uh, can disorient and remember we are also going to have an NBSAB again on top of that um, 
but not that's not going to be lost because um, in this country the issue of restoration and tree planting is domiciled in a different docket and so it is managed differently in fact a different department is responsible for developing the restoration plan uh, from where I sit, we I sit with the focal point for NBC, uh, CBD, and therefore the issue of aligning and reviewing the NBSAP is also in a different docket. Fortunately, they're in the same ministry. So then there's that convergence, and that's why I told you that a few days back we were having that conversation at how to make them converge so that as we approach the restoration, the ecosystem is the same. So you can't come with an NBSAP and then come with a restoration plan, then come with another document. So I guess, and these challenges we have, I think, worldwide in terms of bringing policy documents that are all over, but then implementation is meant to one target uh, ecosystem community or so, and uh, that convergence, we we are working on it. Um, but for the NBSAB, um, we will ensure that as we review the NBSAB, we are making reference to all those strategies of the restoration. Because believe you me, target two is about restoration, conservation and restoration. Target one and two and three, I always say they, they're joint in the hip. I guess we separated for purposes of uh, maybe managing those ecosystems differently. But uh, you can't talk of the other for a minute without mentioning an element in the other targets. So I guess um, the NBSAB most likely will give that convergence and then uh, we'll be able to implement that together. But those, you're right, all those strategies and documents, we have them and we are working towards how we can now consolidate them uh, and they will feed and really uh, enhance the aligning of the NBSAB. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we'll open the floor once more. To colleagues in the room, if you have any questions, any reflections on what you've heard from our two country spotlights, maybe you can share some experiences as well from your NBSAP process, specifically related to Target 2. And the invitation, of course, extends to those of, of you who are joining us online. Feel free to share in the chat about your NBSAP experience and where you are related to Target 2. Let's see if anyone would like to take the floor. Uh, I see Katie's hand. Katie, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Katie Raytar, World Resources Institute. Um, I was wondering if Ms. Naganga could um, speak a little bit more about the data gaps that they found during their assessment of, um, of their NBSAP. Thank you. And, and maybe also how you, how you filled those gaps. That was me. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, data gaps. Data, first of all, we all appreciate that uh, data is a challenge in a number of things. Uh, as I was looking through the guide that uh, when they, uh, they shared, the draft was shared for comments, the issue of data is key because data is the one that informs and you know makes packages your decision making along the way. Um, remember most of the targets have figures like 30%. So when you say 30% restoration globally, when you come to your country or your party, you're asking yourself, is that national target, where are you? So you start looking around and you find a few figures from a few institutions and you cannot consolidate them and say for sure this is where we are as a country. So you pick those and then um, you institute like what we have done as a country, a, a rapid analysis, because we couldn't have time and money to do a comprehensive uh, baseline analysis, we must admit. So what we are call, doing is what we are called lapid uh, analysis. And this is to feed to them, we were calling them in our context, the excess in the targets. Because um, a target for it to be smart must have, uh, unless it's a very, very uh, qualitative target, if it's quantitative, then it must have a figure. And a figure must uh, be factual accurate as much as possible. And we say that because we know of the gaps and the challenges of again, getting all that. So what we have done to address the gaps that we that are there and the gaps to inform our baseline is to do that, uh, to conduct the rapid, uh, uh, rapid uh, assessment. Uh, it's ongoing. And um, along the way, we could still feel that the consultant is also getting the same challenge of getting the data. So, uh, but the beauty about this then going forward is that even though we may start with the data that is not very comprehensive, going forward as we report, by the time we are reporting the, the fourth year, we'll be at a point where now we, if we don't lose the grip, then we'll have a better 
baseline for future. And you also have to be assessing on your progress, whether you're moving, if you started at uh, you know 1% forest cover and you're at 0 0.9, it means you have not really restored, uh, you are going backward. If you're at five, then you're able to work forward and going forward. So I think our, our rapid analysis is one way we, we try to address that. And we are hoping we will build on that because for sure it will not be comprehensive because of the time and the resources we at our disposal. Um, but we, we are hoping that will work for us for the first start. I hope that answers you, Kate. Yes. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the floor? We had some hands a bit earlier. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Kim. Sorry to keep hitting you up, Lucy, but I've got another question for you. You said something that really resonated with me. You said uh, you, you had to deal with many different voices speaking different languages about the same topic. And how difficult was it to to get them to coalesce, to get them to cohesively come together on, on, on what you decided in the end, considering you had all these different people with different ideas trying to put things into your plans? Thank you. Okay, I think where I talked of the difference was about the difference in the documents of having a restoration uh, plan and then having another strategy. At that point, what we are doing is then bringing them together and have a review and consolidate them. However, each strategy speaks to a specific aspect. So it remains, if it's the, like what uh, the moderator talked about, 15 billion. That's a strategy that has a very specific direction. What the NBSAP review will do, we'll go dig into it and see what the synergy is, and a bit, a number of them are coming out. Because remember, even tree planting is a restoration. But then the restoration we want in the MB sub is not just tree planting; it's it's beyond that. So it's 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 synergy along the way, uh, where you can consolidate. You do, but like I explained, how the some of the restoration activities, like tree planting, are domiciled in a different uh, department, and so they have developed their strategies. So what NB sub will do is to synergize with that and repackage what they can, the NBSAP can borrow to this, because this will be a very supreme uh, strategy, I guess, up to 2030. Uh, I know we've lost time along the way, but uh, nevertheless, I tell people, you never know after 2030, we'll push it on and say, we move on with the NBSAP and whatever happens. But um, we th that's how we handle that. In terms of the voices, if it's about the number of um, entities we were bringing to our meetings, the civil society, the academia, the private sector, the, um, of course, different government agencies, of course, with the different in interests. Uh, that's not difficult to handle because um, the, the NB sub is a national strategy and everybody must plug in according to their functions and their mandates. So that's all we do. And it's very accommodative. Uh, we also try to bring on board the targets so that everybody again aligns with that. Fortunately, the 23 targets, um, our national targets are slightly more than 23. Some targets, we split them. Uh, because you remember those of you participating in the negotiations, like target three, I tell people, don't read target three with English. Read it in words. Because we put everything there because we wanted everything there. So there's no English there. There's a whole paragraph, but everything we wanted is there, isn't it? Those inland not in, who don't have inland. So what you do then is at national level, you may be some targets, we split them because we wanted to strengthen them along the institutions where that mandate falls so that they, they are not lost in the negotiator's package. But when it comes home, then it's ours now. So we package it in the best way we know how, and then institutions can pick up. I just allow me to say this, that soon after we have finished aligning, uh, developing our NBSAP, our next agenda is to quickly do a resource mobilization strategy and an implementation framework. We said we don't want to do an implementation framework that is annexed to the NBSAP, because when you annex an implementation plan, it just remains an annex. We want to have an implementation plan that is detached and where we have even a wider stakeholder that if it targets three, Targets two takes four pages, and all the entities that work to work with the target two come on board fine. And then our clearing house mechanism will plug to that and be able to be getting the reports and data to report for the country. Because whoever is working in Kenya, whether state or non-state actor, we shall all come together and report for the country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lucy. We have another question online from Ivan. And Dr. Lucy, you mentioned a very important component that, of course, the NBSAP is taking place. 
the targets are being set, but also the funding plan needs to be put in place, the financing plan and the implementation plan as well. There is a funding gap, which means we have to make tough choices in terms of where we restore. So Ivan Online asks, and this is, would be a question to both you and Mr. Uh, Suzuki as well. Uh, how are you determining which ecosystems to restore or which ones to prioritize as you move towards target two? Maybe we can start with you, Mr. Suzuki. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's it's very, yeah, um, difficult question uh, because uh, uh, our uh, law uh, is intended to have a um, more bottom-up uh, approach. So, uh, of course, uh, for, for Japan, uh, wetland and also grasslands are very um, important uh, ecosystems uh, as well as coast, coastal areas. So I think... Um, we we have identified some priority uh, ecosystems uh, in the uh, NBSAP, but uh, at the same time, the implementation and the uh, establishment of the council uh, is uh, more uh, led by a local initiative. Thank you. I think for Kenya, uh, my colleague from Japan, I think they are more advanced in terms of having com almost, com I think you have completed your NBSAP, um, I think that one will be addressed when we are doing our implementation framework, because uh, this will be a very whole government, whole society approach uh, uh, aspect. Uh, and the reason is the Ministry of Environment, where the focal point is, is more of a coordinating ministry than doing. We really must admit ours is more coordinating, uh, reporting, especially as an obligation is the focal point, but the actual implementation will be with entities. And therefore, when we said we want to do the implementation framework thereafter is because we want the, to have the table wider and more stakeholders on board. And there, the 23 targets are spread all over the ecosystem. So if um, every target gets partners and teams that want to work, fine. But like uh, I say that I think restoration of degraded lads, whether uh, terrestrial, terrestrial um, marine or otherwise, the degraded lads will be a priority. And I guess uh, that's something I would say for now, because I know when we sit to do the implementation framework, that's an aspect we really try to address. And then we'll let the part, the, the, the parties, the in this case, not the parties, but um, the organizations and the agencies and the government agencies that are working there to prioritize according to their, their needs. If it's a ministry for arid and semi-arid, they know the grasses they are working with and within them, they even know the very sensitive ecosystem they want to prioritize. Yeah, I think that's the, the what I can respond for now. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question, and it's come through the chat once again. Um, we have a question about the endorsement of the resource guide. So maybe I can turn the floor briefly to Jamal, just to give us an idea of how can countries endorse the resource guide? What does it look like in terms of the roadmap to call? Yes, thank you, Khalil. Um, I think the best endorsement, since it's, it's not an uh, official or the le legal document, so actually the best endorsement for us is to see how the countries are using it. And um, as we all participating now in the in the plenary discussion on the tools and guidelines, um, the important element is really to, for us to um, to monitor the effectiveness of all guidelines and tools which we're developing. So that would be for us the best criteria, how we would say that this guideline is being endorsed. So the guideline is will be open soon for official review process by the parties uh, and all stakeholder groups. Um, but nevertheless, we would like to have this document or this resource as a living document so, and I think this is important that we don't really do like a one-time endorsement and then we leave with that. So it's an, uh, will be an evolving process as we will learn together with you through this, this process. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. And then um, to, to address the second part of the question, I want to turn it back to, to George. So the, the question asks about the, uh, the guide's ability to uh, acknowledge the sovereignty of local knowledge uh, in understanding of, of degradations, but maybe I can reframe that. Can you just clarify the resource guide um, what is the intention in terms of the use of countries? How did, how, is it a prescriptive guide? And how is it bringing together all those other guidelines which you highlighted on, I think, your second slide, the staper, the standards, et cetera? So maybe you can just clarify the, the role of the, the resource guide. So the main, the main role of the resource guide is to um, help all of us think about some of the thorny problems that are involved with 
uh, planning and implementing um, and achieving uh, target two. So with regard to sovereignty of knowledge and that sort of thing, um, uh, that's, you know, that's uh, throughout all sorts of UN documents and, and procedures and so forth. And, and it's also in all of the restoration principles and standards of practice deal with these issues of, of, uh, of stakeholders and knowledge holders and indigenous people and so forth. And, and so I think that that is, is well covered in, in the global guidance that, that exists. So the role of the resource guide is not to create mechanisms for doing that. Those, those mechanisms exist elsewhere. The role of the guide is to point people toward, uh, toward that. Um, with regard to, you know, the, the, the issue of, of degradation, though, this is a, an interesting problem that the Society for Ecological Restoration and Partners are working with um, that has to do with uh, how people perceive uh, degradation and thus how do they perceive targets for restoration. So what is degraded to, to one person may not be degraded to another. Um, and so we have to be really focused on on that, that, that what we feel is intact or uh, undegraded may not be uh, so in, in, in another person's mind or, or in their experience and so forth. And, and this is really um, one of the things that we will try to focus on is with regard to degradation and, and, and um, the way people perceive things has to do with this interface between production and natural ecosystems. And it's really important to understand that defining degradation for natural ecosystems is a different exercise than defining rest, uh, degradation for production um, ecosystems. And so uh, a quick example is, is soil fertility. So the loss of soil fertility um, in, in an agricultural production landscape is generally a bad thing. And so we need to figure out a way to bring back fertility, soil organic carbon and so forth um, to restore production to those, uh, to those ecosystems. But that same practice of increasing soil organic carbon or increasing nutrient loads in natural ecosystems may be a bad thing because many natural ecosystems are nutrient poor. And in fact, some of the highest biodiverse ecosystems on earth are, are nutrient poor. And so adding nutrients to those systems would be a bad thing. And so it's very important um, when, when assessing degradation and planning for restoration that, that, uh, that we determine what the question is Right, and be very clear about what it is that we're trying to accomplish, and make sure, um, like has happened in the past, that we don't, you know, that we don't create collateral damage in our in our efforts to to do restoration. So these are the kinds of things that the guide is trying to help with to 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 bring up these issues that are very important, and to point people toward the guidance that can help to make those decisions. Sorry if that was a little bit long. No, that's perfect. He brought us right up to time. So thank you so much, Rich. And also, uh, colleagues, uh, let, please join me in actually giving a, a nice round of applause to our country spotlights, Dr. Lucy Ngang and Mr. Suzuki. We'll move to the final segment of our program. I want to uh, introduce Mr. Julian Fox from FAO, who's also the coordinator of the Task Force on Monitoring. Um, Julian is going to provide a, an update on FIRM, the Framework for Ecosystem Restoration Monitoring. Uh, he's going to touch on the importance of interoperability and speak to how we can expect to partake in this global exercise on monitoring restoration. Over to you, Julian. Yes. Okay, th thank you very much, Khalil, and welcome, everybody. It's very late in the day, so I'll, I'll be relatively brief. But my colleagues online will um, will share some resources in the in the chat, so it's on it's on the way. But basically, I was going to give an update on um, indicator two point one area under restoration, and uh, as has been mentioned, um, when target two was adopted, it, we dovetailed it with a lot of progress and work under the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, and under the UN decade on rest, ecosystem restoration we had developed what we called the framework for ecosystem restoration monitoring, really trying to build a framework building on interoperability and, and encouraging national capacity, capacity, national data sets, but really providing some resources and, and a global platform to monitor progress um, of the UN decade. So it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay, um, next slide, please, yes. Perfect. Just to mention, and we'll put in the, the uh, link, the, the, we've been working through the RTEG process on, on the metadata for, for indicator 2.1, area under restoration. And we've, we've received a lot of great feedback. And the, the, the methodology and the metadata, we think, is, is looking great. And here are some of, the, some of the elements. It really builds on 
everything we've done before. We, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's been the STAPA. There's the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. There's a lot of incredible resources and a lot of restoration platforms. And um, so we really wanted to develop metadata for, for the indicator that built on all this previous progress and really encourages, as we've heard so many times today and yesterday, national data sets, national capacity. And we're, we're trying to use interoperability to speak to different national, regional, and global platforms. Uh, next slide, please. Just to mention, we, we build on some really nice work on interoperability. I think uh, interoperability is, um, is critical in, in, uh, in a lot of global processes now because there are many platforms, um, national, regional, and global, and we, we don't want to have to create parallel work streams. So having different platforms speaking to each other is, is really powerful. So actually, SCR did a, did a really nice a guide for us and contributing to the UN Decade, and we have fully adopted that into the indicator methodology. I think that I won't speak to the parameters too much, but they've been through the RTEG process and we can provide a link to the, to the metadata and the parameters in the chat. So the next slide, I think this is quite important to show is that under the UN Decade um, and, the, and the firm, we're really trying to create that transparent global snapshot, but we want that, we want to encourage in parallel your national restoration databases, your national capacity to implement and monitor restoration, but we want them to speak to each other. And we think through the through the CBD process, there'll be an opportunity to, to have the global data and the national data sort of speaking to each other. And when you have your national data, when you're doing your, your reporting, we can, you can basically, uh, we can then take that and use that for the UN Decade reporting, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. So the diagram is just showing that we, again, we're going to use the interoperability and the, and the CBD reporting platform to make sure that your, your national data comes to the global data and we'll provide an offering of global data, but you can override that if you have your own national data. So, um, yeah. Next slide, please. Yes, so again, a data compilation, global, regional, national data. We want to do a lot of the hard work behind the scenes for you. So a lot of the other big restoration platforms like Restore and um, the Restoration Barometer from IUCN, we're building interoperability with those platforms to basically serve um, a restoration data set to the, to the parties of the CBD to help you monitor your progress and also to, to adjust your targets through, through the coming years. So, and yeah, just to mention again, through the UN decade, we'll be, we'll be providing, you know, a global compilation and sort of a dashboard of progress um, as, we, as we move toward 2030. Next slide, please. So what is, what is the firm? Um, actually, it's been great to hear over the last two days, the presentation of many tools and platforms. It's another platform, but we think it can be helpful for restoration. It was developed for the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, but it was developed through a huge collaborative effort of um, many different partners to the decade and really trying to build collaboration and, and coordination amongst different restoration platforms. So we have a few different elements to the firm and maybe I'll, I'll continue straight on because I know we're, we're very short on time. Oh, we're okay, 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 great. Okay, great, excellent. So we have a, we have a registry where you can actually register your, your restoration action um, we have a, a geospatial platform where you can interrogate your, your restoration actions using global data. We have a really powerful search engine, actually, with restoration good practices. I think there's over 1,500 uh, restoration good practices, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a moment. And we're developing a dashboard that can be used to, to monitor global progress um, for the UN decade. Next slide, please. So, yeah, I mean... We really, we really want to encourage you to build your national capacity, your national data sets for restoration. But if you would like to interact with our platform, you're very welcome to register your different initiatives, uh, national, subnational, into the, into the firm. And the firm is fully aligned with, with Target 2 and Indicator 2.1. So anything that goes into the firm registry will, is fully aligned to the, to the CBD target. Um, next slide, please. 
And a very powerful platform, actually, again, building on the concept of interoperability is a search engine we've developed with several partners who are listed here to help interrogate and search for good practices on restoration. We've heard from George and you know the development of the resource guide. It's not always easy to, to, a, to, think, to think about restoration in different ecosystems, but if you, if you go into this platform, this, the, the firm search engine, you can search, I think 1,500 good practices and you can also, there's also an opportunity to register your own restoration good practice. So again, another, another tool to help parties or restoration practitioners identify good practice, replicate it, or register their own um, good practice. Yeah, just very quickly, a, a case study that we have. We have um, in the firm, we have, we have data from over 100 countries already. But um, a very nice example that I'll quickly go through is of sustainable land management in Afghanistan. It's, it's available on the firm platform. And with working, working actually with the Jeff Secretariat, we've aligned um, indicator 2.1 and, and the, with, with the Jeff requirements. So Jeff projects, we have a, a nice workflow for them to come into the, um, into the firm. And I won't talk too much about the specifics, but just to let you know that we have some some very nice examples. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, again, this is this is the sort of the data and the output, and it helps the project also report to the Jeff indicators as well as feeding into um, uh, Target Two. Final slide, please. Yeah, so please um, reach out, join us. We we have a task force for monitoring. We have regular task force meetings. I think we have over four hundred experts engaged. And uh, you're very welcome to write to this email here if you would like to contribute. And, and we really encourage you to use the platforms and tools we developed under the UN Decade, but they can really support Target 2 implementation and monitoring and Indicator 2.1. Um, just to mention, we, as well as the resource guide that was presented today, we're also planning for an e-learning um, to be launched at, at COP16. So I think on that note, I will pass back to back to Khalil. Thanks, Khalil. Thank you very much, Jim. Let's give a round of applause for the presentation. I, I see we've been joined in the back of the room by many colleagues. We were under the impression that you were interested in our event, but I think there is a an event just after us. So we will we will skip questions. I'll invite uh, those if you have questions, please do share them with us uh, via the chat. Um, and I think to close, I will pass over to Jamal, the CBD secretary, to, to send it yes. from. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you, FAO and uh, UNEP, and of course, our speakers from the countries, Japan, which was is one of the first countries submitting the NBSAP, and of course, Kenya, were for so much ownership for this process and uh, such a comprehensive um, review process for the NBSAP. So just being really short, um, Please join us in reviewing these resource which we're offering. And uh, we'll see you at the COP16 at the Restoration Day, where we will be launching more resources. And also in the 2025, uh, the year where we really would like to get engaged with the countries and offering the platform for the countries to learn from each other. So because I think that's where really the experience and knowledge is. So thank you again. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll close there. Thanks.